Mr. Chancellor, I have the honor to present to you Jill Marcus and to request that you confer on her the degree Doctor of Commerce Honoris Causa. The decision by Council and Senate to award her this degree has been taken on the grounds of the following considerations. As Governor of the South African Reserve Bank, Ms. Jill Marcus now finds herself at the forefront of public life in South Africa, following a career of exceptional achievements as politician, business lady, and leader, policy maker, and concerned citizen. She is the granddaughter of Lithuanian immigrants, and both her parents were anti-apartheid activists. As a consequence, she left South Africa for exile in London with her parents in 1969, only to return to South Africa 21 years later. In London, she joined the ANC and became Deputy Secretary of their Department of Information and Publicity. She worked in the family salad bar, where she gained invaluable business experience. For 15 years, she edited a news bulletin to keep the exile community informed of events in South Africa, despite the efforts of the South African Security Services to suppress the freedom movement in London. At the same time, she completed a B.Com degree through UNISA. Near the Chancellor, dames and heren, to the political landscape in 1990, was she one of the first ANC leaders who came to Africa. It was her task to build capacity in the public ANC, especially in communication, and to ensure that the party was treffend and the political overgang could deal. As hoof van inlichting en publiciteit voor die ANC het sy een groot rol gespeel in die aanloop tot die 1994 verkiesing. Sy is daarna tot parlementslid verkies en onder haar leiderskap het die gesamentlijke staande komitee vir finansies een van die gedigste parlementaire komitees geword wat departementes aanspreeklikheid met groot sukses afgedwong het. In 1996 is sy as adjunct minister van finansies aangestel and had later a young president of the South African Reserve Bank. In 2009, she became the first woman to hold the position of governor of the Reserve Bank. The decision of the Monetary Policy Committee taken under her leadership have a direct effect. Decisions of the Monetary Policy Committee taken under her leadership have a direct effect on the lives of all South Africans via the cost of credit and an indirect effect through the impact of this on economic activity, job creation and prices. Ms. Marcus is widely known for the humility, vision, accessibility and expertise with which she fulfills her role. She also eagerly shares her experience with the next generation of business leaders among others as professors in policy, leadership, and general studies at the Gordon School of Business during 2004 to 2007. Mr. Chancellor, I request that you confer on Jill Marcus the degree Doctor of Commerce honoris causa for a leading role as politician, business leader, monetary policymaker, and concerned South African citizen, and for her sound leadership as governor of the South African Reserve Bank. <coughs> Dr. Llewellyn McMaster, Program Director, um, Dr. Johan Rupert, Chancellor of the University. You shouldn't embarrass me like that. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Botman, Vice Chancellor of the University. Um, I don't see the Chairperson of Council, Mr. George Stein. Um, Professor Fulyun, President of the Convocation, Members of Council, Members of Senate, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Dr. Fenerov, I must tell you the reason people are so smart at Stellenbosch is because of the wine. <laughs> so that certainly adds to um, make things not only interesting, but uh, certainly contributes to the stellar research output here. 
Uh, Ms. Marcus was appointed as the governor of the South African Reserve Bank in November 2009 and has steered the institution with distinction. During her tenure, she has managed to ensure that the bank achieves its mandate by ensuring that the consumer price index remains mostly within the inflation target range of 3 to 6 percent. This was achieved despite the fact that economic conditions necessitated the adoption of counter-cyclical accommodative monetary policy in an effort to stimulate the domestic economy and which of course took place against the backdrop of significant challenges in the global economy, which as a matter of interest has entered its sixth year of anemic growth rates and elevated levels of unemployment, particularly in the euro area. These extraordinary conditions, along with the deterioration in fiscal policy space, has propelled central banks to the center of the policymaking stage, and Jamie Karuhana, general manager of the Bank of International Settlements, at our meeting in June, went so far to describe central banks as policymakers of last resort. In their efforts to ameliorate the effects of the global financial crisis, central banks have, since 2007, injected approximately $11 trillion into the global financial system. Ms. Marcus has played a crucial role in improving both the communication by and levels of interaction that the bank has with outside parties through various outreach programs, such as the bank's economic roundtables, the regional monetary policy forums, and the accessible language with which the Monetary Policy Committee communicates its policy stance following its meeting. The bank has also made huge strides in further expanding and strengthening its role in overseeing and maintaining financial stability. She has further solidified the role and influence of the SARP in the global community of central banks, and she has recently been named at the autumn meeting of the IMF and the World Bank in Tokyo as the 2012 Emerging Market Central Bank Governor of the Year for Sub-Saharan Africa. This past year has also seen the successful launch of the Mandela Banknote Series and a further example of her approach of leading by example has been the announcement that the bank's executive and board members have agreed to a salary freeze and I sincerely hope that this example will be more wide, widely followed. In addition to the above, she has played other important roles within our public institutions such as serving as chairperson of the Joint Standing Committee on Finance which under her leadership became one of the most formidable parliamentary committees of notable success in holding departments to public account. Her success led to her appointment as Deputy Minister of Finance, and she's furthermore made significant contributions to the area of financial regulation in her roles as Chairperson of the Financial Services Board, as well as the Standing Committee for the Revisions of the Banks Act. Prior to her appointment as Governor of the SARP, Governor Marcus also served as APSA's non-executive Chairperson as non-executive uh, director of Goldfields and of Bidvest, she served on the advisory board of the Auditor General and on the Millennium Labor Council. While a business leader at the highest level, she also shared her experience with the next generation of leaders as professor of policy, leadership, and gender studies at the Gordon School of Business from 2004 to 2007. She remains involved in the academic world as chairperson of the selection committee for the South African at Large Rhodes Scholarship. In an interview nearly 20 years ago, and Wills, on the brink of the prominent public life described in broad outlines above, she explained how she was motivated by, by the desire to live a life that has value, which she understood to mean a life of contributions to others. And it is a desire she roots in the best Jewish traditions of her own background that have stood on the side of humanity against oppression for the liberation of ideas, even apart from just the idea of liberation. On the personal note, Governor, I wish to welcome you as a fellow alumni of my beloved alma mater, despite what some people would like to write. And I'm very pleased that uh, you join our, our ranks. I therefore ask you to um, kindly join me on toasting Ms. Marcus in a valuable life which has been to our collective benefit. We are truly blessed to have someone of a calibre serving us in public life.
as the governor is making a way forward, um, I just want to say that um, we are four governors at the bank, and um, I and the, my fellow two deputy governors are below 50 years of age. And I must say that uh, Ms. Marcus makes us work. She, we, we really battle to keep up with her, but well done. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Francois, for those very kind words and for everybody for bestowing this extraordinary honor on me. Um, I'm very humbled and grateful to be part of a very illustrious team. And my co-honorees, um, deal with hearts and minds. So I'm in the middle between the hearts and the minds and uh, perhaps try to make sense of some of the challenges that we face. Taking the cue from you, Johan, and what you have said, I think there are a number of challenges. Look, let's face a couple of things. One, life's not fair, okay? So don't expect it to be. And the question that we face as challenges, we're dealing with people. In the end, that's who we're dealing with. They're ordinary people like you and me. And people have a motivation that drives them. They don't act for what's in your head. They act for what's in their own interest. So the challenge that we face is how do we exercise reason and choice in an environment in which greed prevails? Okay? So part of our challenge is to, first of all, I think, Johan, you need to start much younger. If we're talking about children, we've got to start under seven. You've got to be there with the question of six months to seven years. And if we focus on that, we will make all the difference in the world, especially in a society that is grossly unequal. And part of that challenge that you have in dealing with children is because we have a very significant number of female-headed households and child-headed households. And therefore, what happens to the child? Who takes care of them? Where do they go? What happens to them in that formative time? So for me, the challenge for everyone in this room, everyone in this room has a huge sphere of influence. How do we exercise that sphere of influence to make a difference in a child's life below seven? Because when you're intervening, no matter how good that intervention is later, the, 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 the talent and the potential has been limited by the experience. So to me, that's the starting point. And I think if we can all make that effort, because that's, that is, by the way, pre-SAT to pre-unions, pre-everything else, is something that we can make a difference. And as the point that Bernie was making about the difference you make in creating a, a sense of excellence, I think we have those challenges. The second thing I'd like to thank is the ability to interact with Stellenbosch, because we do at the bank, and we have a, a very good working relationship. And I'd like to thank Stan and Ben Smith for the kind of interactions that we have, for the, the uh, engagement, for the diligence, for the rigor. Because it is that question of rigor that is so important. It's part of our challenge to be much more open with our society and recognize that as a society, we do not necessarily talk the same language or understand things in the complexity of today's world. So how do we make monetary policy accessible? It touches everybody's lives. The rand in the pocket is part of what people experience. How do we create a circumstance in which we have a much more informed public, and a public that is able to recognize and exercise their own reason and choice? Because they understand compound interest, for an example. They understand what it means to be indebted and that when you need something, we've got to have a look at the question of savings. And if we want to deal with those things, we've got to deal with employment. Because education and unemployment are two sides of the same coin. And therefore, when we can look at education, education is the means by which we break the cycle of ignorance, as well as the cycle of unemployment. Because the person who goes in and gets their job for the first time has a huge responsibility in terms of their families so that the family is also better because you've got an education and you've got a job and you've got a meaningful life ahead. And the challenge that I want to then also place with us is how do we deal with the question of young people today? This is not a South African issue. This is a global issue. Unemployment in Spain is at 56% of youth, higher than ours. Right? 
And employment in France is over 33% in youth. This is not a, an emerging market question or a South African question. The nature of the world is changing and changing rapidly. The opportunities for work, meaningful work, is disappearing in terms of what youth, young people see as their future. The consequence of the cr global crisis in the advanced economy is we're going to pay a very dear price going forward. Francois mentioned it's gone into its sixth year, but we know we're now out of it. If you look at the numbers, if you look at the talk, it's still got, assume nothing gets worse, we're still going to get out of it. And assume that takes the same amount of time as it took to get into it. We're talking another six, seven, ten years. You're talking about generations <coughs> that are lost. So if you are 20 and you haven't found a job, even if you've got a degree, you might be 30 before you're working and this thing is beginning to come out. Are you employable after 10 years? If you lose your job at 50, what happens to you? Because you're not going to work again. And I'm talking about the advanced economies. I'm not talking about us. And yet you have a decision in the United States which says let's rather go over the cliff because then in six months' time we might have a meaningful, meaningful conversation. They should bloody be charged with what they're doing to the rest of the world. I think it's absolutely unacceptable to have that kind of thinking and irresponsibility. And then it comes back to ourselves. So for me it's about how do we, in the privilege that is around this room, exercise our own responsibilities how do we make a difference to say that is the future that we can build together? How do we get there? How do we get there? And part of that is not just standing for what's right. It's standing against what's wrong. And creating that sense of purpose that we can do it together. And I would end on the note, first of all, just in terms of thanking you. I really feel very uh, honored by the doctorate that has been awarded to me. But I would say that we end with the words or the, or the letters because when we look at ourselves, we say we are Africans, right? The last letters of the African is I can. And I think if we take that spirit of I can and that together we can, we can make this country be what it can be, which we've seen. We have such talent. We have extraordinary achievement. And we've got to make that real for everybody because if my life does not have meaning, Yours has no meaning to me. And therefore, that meaningful life, that sense of purpose, that sense that I can be something, has to permeate amongst all South Africans and not this great divide that we have and that, that divide that is being used at the moment in an unfortunate way. So thank you all very much. And I'm very privileged to be part of OPI and, and, uh, and Bernie's, um, that the three of us are together. It's a real privilege. For those who don't know, Bernie and I know each other from when we were born. He was born before me, and I'm still trying to catch up, but <laughs> we've known each other all our lives, and, and, and we're very privileged to be, have been friends for all of that period of time, because it's an honor to work with Bernie, and I really appreciate what uh, Professor Oppie has achieved. It's, we both were saying, as we sort of listened to these books that have been written and everything else, I say, you know, don't we feel a little bit out of uh, the right company? So congratulations to both of you, and it's a privilege to be with you, and thank you all very much indeed.